you know, originally the uh, the plan was that uh, Jennifer and Seth Farbman were going to have a, a nice, intimate sort of fireside chat, uh, Q and A session. But uh, well, it'll hopefully try and replicate that just over multiple hundreds of miles. Uh, but we uh, really want to thank uh, uh, Seth Farbman. He's the chief marketing officer at uh, Spotify uh, for for sticking with us and being uh, flexible. Uh, as the CMO for Spotify, uh, uh, Seth uh, uh, has overall responsibility for the Spotify brand, the customer experience, and all marketing and external communication worldwide across more than 60 countries and a customer base of over 100 million. Uh, prior to Spotify, Seth was the chief marketing officer for Gap, where he helped to drive a rapid turnaround and increase the share price almost threefold. Before Gap, he launched uh, Ogilvy Earth, the, the world's leading sustainability marketing agency. This past year, Seth was named one of Forbes' top 10 most influential CMOs in the world and one of the top 50 most creative people by Creative Magazine. Uh, he earned his master's degree in communication and journalism from a uh, school that Notre Dame will be visiting tomorrow, Syracuse University. So thank you very much, uh, Seth, for, for joining us. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to Jim. OK, great. Can you hear me? Hi, Seth. Hi there. How are you? I'm the all great and mighty all. <laughs> You just need music nope. playing in the background. I know. Nobody should have to look at me at that scale. My God. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being with us um, through the wonders of technology. Um, we're sorry that you had the, the, the challenges last night with your flight, but we're so pleased you're able to join us in this capacity. So thank you so much. Of course. Um, I'm really excited to be chatting with Seth about this topic of meaningful marketing because I think he represents, I mean, he just brings such an incredible breadth of experience to bear. Um, he comes from, um, as Tim said, you know, Agent Ogilvy, he was at The Gap, now he's at Spotify. And um, I think he's, he's sort of like in a really unique place um, as a CMO and has a really unique vantage point on how the industry is changing, how brand still matters in um, a hyper-connected, multi-platform world. And um, I think he also has his finger on the pulse of the next generation of consumers and marketers, if you will. In fact, um, one thing that I do at Forbes is I edit the, um, the annual um, list of Forbes 30 under 30 in marketing and advertising. And um, that, for me, is an incredible education because on the one, while on the one hand I'm, I'm interviewing amazing folks like Seth with incredible years of experience, I'm also able to kind of get exposure to the next generation of, of um, marketing disruptors. And that's really the level that we, um, the bar that we set. But Seth actually um, had nominated to the list a couple years ago now someone who used to, Rachel Tipograph, who used to work for him. Um, she headed up social media at The Gap. and. Um, She's obviously, her star has, has risen exponentially since then. But um, to me, it's a real testament to, to the way that Seth is so um, knowledgeable about, obviously, not just how big brands succeed, but also he's able to sort of see what the next generation um, looks like, um, again, both as consumers and as marketing leaders. So um, with that, Seth, I think what I'd love to have you do for everybody here is just give a little bit flesh out the, the bio, um, tell your story just a little bit more so we kind of understand the, the, the origin, your origin story and your, and your personal brand narrative, if you will. Sure, happy to. Um, just to be clear, I'm not on 30 under 30. <laughs> and there's no way I'm ever going to get there. Um, I always start my story by telling people that uh, I tend to believe that uh, many marketers don't intend to get into marketing, but something tragic happens in their lives and they end up there. Uh, I actually studied journalism. Uh, I went to Newhouse, Syracuse, um, go orange, see you guys soon. Um, and my, my desire from a fairly early age was really to, uh, to tell stories that I thought would be useful and helpful to people. And I believed that, um, you know, honest and open information um, was key. And that can come through educational institutions, that can come through the fourth estate, that can come also through brands. But much of my sort of point of view as a marketer comes from not really being a marketer at my core. 
So I spent about five, no, about six and a half years as a journalist. And um, I found it in some ways uh, incredibly rewarding and edifying. Um, but I also started to realize that journalism, and this is going back a few years, that journalism was in fact really uh, a business. And I realized it during this point uh, in my career where I was covering a hurricane and I was in uh, Virginia, in Virginia Beach. And my job was to do those cut-ins. Every 15 minutes, you talk about when the hurricane is gonna be here and when you should start panicking and all of those things, right? The problem was the hurricane wasn't coming. There was no news. But I had to stand there in my very dry raincoat by the one little tree that was maybe like blowing a little bit. I think maybe we had a string on it. We were pulling it. <laughs> and tell people that the world is about to end and the hurricane was coming. And during one of these cuttings, we went back into the live truck and I said to my producer, I, what the hell am I doing here, right? It's, it feels like we're not adding real value, that the story that we're telling is for our benefit, not theirs. And she said, listen, don't ever, ever question how important it is what we do. If it weren't for us, well, the commercials would just bang together. <laughs> So at that point, I thought, well, why the hell don't I just make the commercials then? And so for me, I really started to question whether, uh, you know, whether journalism was the only way that you could be useful to people and the only way that you could communicate things of value. And quite accidentally, as I was trying to figure out what, what came next, um, you know, a marketing director at a company that doesn't even exist anymore was uh, GTE, it's part of Verizon Wireless. Um, we just got introduced and we started to talk about the challenges he had with marketing. How do I connect with people? Should I be involved in the community? Um, are we creating some sort of value by looking beyond the product that we're selling into, you know, something much bigger and community focused? And I started to develop a thought here that, in fact, the platforms that brands have are incredibly powerful. And the products and brands that I respected most did things. They focused on the quality of the product. They didn't try to sell something that didn't exist or they weren't proud of. And that the brands were greater than the product itself. And I started to realize there's an opportunity to create mission and purpose that would drive the growth of a company, but also would drive, um, you know, the quality of life for people. And that's incredibly sustainable. When you're giving something to someone that fundamentally makes their lives better, you don't have to worry about the transaction. Uh, the, the growth will come automatically. And at that time, I was entering into a, a, a wireless category that had just gone from, you know, I mean, think about it, cell phones in the old days, they were like doctors, lawyers, Charlie Sheen and Paul Street, uh, cost $1,000, and you looked like an idiot holding it up to your face. Um, and it went from this exclusive product to one that was available for everyone it fundamentally changed people's lives. It removed anxiety, it created connections that you couldn't have, and it fundamentally changed the growth of society, the growth of other industries, and uh, really the control that people had in their lives. So it was a great first way to uh, apply kind of this combination of, of doing good and being useful with a business construct um, you know, that would allow uh, sustainable growth for the company. Okay, great. Um, so, but Seth, you have some sort of um, strong thoughts about what's been lost lately among brands as far as narrative and story. Talk a little bit about that, um, where data has changed things. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. Marketing goes through these these phases where 
uh, there is a buzzword or a concept that just catches fire. And um, big data a few years ago was all that anyone talked about. Nobody knew what it was, nobody knew what to do with it, but we all got convinced that it was all about data. And it is all about data. But um, what's happened in the marketing industry uh, in the last few years is um, its marketing leaders have relied on data to essentially show the value of the creative work, and show the value of marketing in general. And while that's, um, well, that's terrific, it, you, if you're not careful, you end up only looking at what the data is telling you. And you cannot measure everything. And the truth is, what we are measuring, especially for digital, uh, is quite suspect at times. I think you know Facebook sort of raised our attention to that um, as well. When you follow the data as a measurement tool and not an insight tool, uh, I get very, very nervous. Yeah. About data, in my view, is that it allows you to simply understand what people uh, want and need in ways that they may not even understand themselves. It allows you to focus in on individual needs, but understand where they are common across a very large segment. So it it gives you a it gives you a a source of narrative that was never before possible. And what we've done here at Spotify is we've used our massive data to really understand the relationship people have with music. And it's very easy just to say, well, everyone loves listening to music. But the way people listen to it um, in their lives is very telling and very meaningful. And if, you're, if you apply creativity, which we cannot underestimate, we cannot look past the data and say that creativity is secondary. The data informs it. So when you apply creativity, you can find pieces of data that are just fascinating. I'll give you a quick example. Um, we started to look at the playlists at Spotify. And people give you information without even knowing it. They simply name the playlist for the emotional or practical reason that they built it. We, uh, we started to see uh, a number of playlists that were titled something like, Play This at My Funeral. So people were constructing their own, I mean, talk about control freaks, right? They're gone. <laughs> They're reaching out from the grave to say, this is what I want these people to listen to. And we saw that that was very, a very common and growing thing. So we take that insight and say, Music is so important to people, it's so meaningful to how they are represented as a human being, that they actually want that uh, when everyone is gathered to think about that. Right? They want to soundtrack their own life even when it's over. So we start to think about telling that story. And as an example, um, we looked at one of these playlists and we noticed that Green Day was uh, very prominent in the playlist of play this at my funeral. So we thought, why don't we just reach out to Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day and actually do a commercial where he is first realizing that he's on this playlist and where he is so confused by that, but what do you do? Like, you got to respect that. And then actually cut to this very awkward scene of mourners dancing the playlist, not knowing what the hell they're supposed to be doing. So, like, the data uh, can provide, like, this very weird, unusual, but personal uh, narrative that then you can create uh, a, a very compelling, funny story from. And that, to me, is the best use of data. Yeah, because you said to me earlier when we were talking about this conversation, you said marketing has been very focused on execution and what suffered is empathy for people you know, understanding of what's going on in their lives. And so it's gotten less good, more measurable, but less good. So the combination of really measurable and really good is sort of obviously what everybody's aiming for at this point. And that's where empathy comes in and that's where discernment comes in and that's where judgment comes in. And so if you're blindly sort of leading what the data tells you that you're not, you're not really being a marketer and, and 
I'm a big believer in um, curiosity. I'm a big believer in social sciences. I'm a big believer in, you know, culture and anthropology, all of these things that help us understand the human condition and the emotional state of people. You know, there's this old saying in, uh, in marketing uh, that you want to create brand love, right? It's love, love, love. Um, I actually think the first thing that we can do as marketers is um, reduce anxiety and fear, right? And that's where the empathy comes in. Like, really take the time to figure out how you can be useful. And if you are consistently useful and consistently help solve those problems, the expression back from a customer to a brand will be love. Yeah. Uh, but if we don't apply, like, we don't take our responsibility. I could do a Spider-Man quote here, but I won't. Um, but we do have to take our responsibility really, really seriously. We have a lot of money. We have a huge platform. Our messages shape the way that we think about ourselves and our society. And it is very easy to take, um, you know, to take the, the shortcut around create fear or make people feel less comfortable and secure with who they are in order to then give them a solution. I think it's really incumbent on us to think how you know, through our companies and our products we can uplift people's lives. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I just take that really seriously and think everybody ought to. Yeah, and as a side, also, I mean, that's informing who you're hiring, right? The kind of skill sets you want. You want folks, as you said, with psychology backgrounds, anthropology, you know, study, like those areas are all so important. Um, who do you want working for you right now? Yeah, I mean, look, you have to have a very diverse um, uh, team. It's diverse in every single way. It's a global society. Like one of the things I was very proud of, a gap uh, where I really kind of built a team from square one. It, I mean, it was like it was like you know a UN convention intentionally hired people with different points of view. So the person who ran ad advertising was from Costa Rica. The person who ran events was from India. We think about, we thought about it in a way that we provide all of these points of view so that we could have that level of empathy. And then when it comes to skill set, I think you need some tension, right? Like, um, so often we want everyone to get along and agree, uh, and that's great, but we also want people to challenge one another. So. What I like to do is I like to have a sort of marketing sciences group that is just constantly interested in learning, 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 learning. And you pair them with uh, people who are interested in culture and in art, in case of music, um, and who want to actually create something that's never been created before. And I think when you have some of those points of view, then you can you can put an idea into the marketplace, right? Because you don't need to test with focus groups. You have an idea, you bring it to life, you make it, you send it out into the world, and almost instantly you can see the reaction to it. Uh, and then, you know, what you're doing now is you're inventing um, new ways of communicating. So it's that balance of the art and science, which sounds like a cliche, but you have to respect both sides of it. And you have to get people somewhat at odds uh, in order to get, you know, the really the most unique and powerful work. You cannot replace the value and the power of an idea. Once an idea gets in someone's head, it is there for good. You cannot unthink something. And that comes through bravery and creativity uh, and a little bit of fearlessness. Yeah. What about partnerships? I mean, especially when meaningful marketing is so important to you and that brand purpose is so vital. Um, how do you how do you engage with either external partners like agencies and, and ad tech players, for example, and other companies that are that are designed to help you with your business, your marketing business, um, and also you know partnerships with um, celebrities or anybody else who you feel are going to be brand ambassadors. How do you view that challenge, but also that opportunity? I mean, I think it really just starts with clarity on what your purpose is, what your vision is. Uh, for instance, at Gap, I was quite, um, I was quite fortunate. And here's an iconic American brand that was started by a husband and wife in 1969. 
they had purpose built into it. They wanted to create a store with the heart. They wanted to create not just a clothing company, but a company that supported um, youth and change. In 1969, that was the boomers, right? It was like my parents. That was the emerging uh, um, generation. And so built into then every product could be that point of view. Um, at Spotify, we also have an amazing founder story. And, you know, this company was built by a, by a guy, by a couple of guys who really just loved music and they loved tech. And they realized the music did, was collapsing in on itself. It, uh, it was shrinking, piracy was rampant. People were stealing music, and that artist could no longer live off of the art that they created, which is fundamentally bad for society. They believed, and I believe. So when you start at that point, then you say, okay, we are mission-driven. Our success is perfectly aligned with our partner's success. Uh, at Spotify, the more successful artists are, the more successful we'll be, uh, because our job is to bring artists and music bands, you know, together. So you have to start with that clear understanding of what you're ultimately doing. And then you look for brands that have similar uh, belief systems. They don't have to be even, you know, in the same industry. We, we engaged about a year ago in a partnership with Starbucks, and we, we kind of started a little bit at the transactional, What's your customer base look like? What's our customer base look like? How can we help each other? And then we realized that at a much higher level, what we ultimately both wanted to do was create better environments, create sort of better emotional states and to bring people together, right? And that becomes the center of your partnership. And that's how you have to start evaluation because then everything else downstream just becomes so much easier. Um, we also talk, you have strong feelings again on um, this concept of, Something we brought up earlier, but marketing um, marketing isn't about being liked by everyone. And sort of what you stand for isn't going to be standing for everyone necessarily. You know, so as you look at like a Spotify or a Gap, talk a little bit about your 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 perspective on that issue. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, it's it's one of the pressures that you get when you're a company because you you, you know, you want to expand to everyone and you don't want to be exclusive to anyone, right? Every, every segment is an opportunity. And if, uh, if you want to reach every segment, then you have to find um, the, you know, the lowest common denominator in many cases. I think one of the roles of purpose is to find the highest common denominator, something that taps into a human truth. Uh, but you have to be very definitive about what that is. And you have to accept the fact that people are going to disagree with you. It's something I really learned um, uh, at Gap. It was a point of view that I brought in, and it was, uh, you know, a tremendous learning. Um, what we saw as we built out both our social capabilities and our content delivery, what we saw was that our favorability, if you look at net sentiment, for instance, uh, it, it went up quite a bit. We got much more um, light. Um, but we, we got to a point where we were liked, but the conversation around our content or our point of view stopped growing. And so we knew that we had to get sharper. And part of it is around who we were for, but part of it was our points of view. And they had nothing to do with the clothes. They had, it was a point of view around that everybody should earn a living wage. And we unilaterally decided to raise uh, the minimum wage we paid our employee. It was around that pay equality was uh, a necessity and a right. And so we made sure that was um, uh, that was an action. And we had very clear points of view on uh, sort of human equality. And we took a very strong stand on marriage equality. And we knew that we would um, we would upset some people. But you gain so much more because your employee base becomes even uh, a bigger believer in the company. And they perform better, they're happier, they work harder, they solve problems. Your customers understand 
that you care about things. And that naturally translates into the products you're creating. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's really critical to have a sharp point of view and to stick to it. And if that means that there are some people who are not part of your customer base, it's okay. As long as you believe what you're doing is right. Um, let's let's compare and contrast Spotify and Gap as brands. Um, I'd argue they're both really iconic. Spotify is a lot younger than Gap, obviously, um, and there are, I mean, there's you know, challenges and opportunities with both. There's pluses and minuses um, with both. Um, talk a little bit about that. How you viewed, you know, kind of the role of brand for both of those, and also the sort of the, the the brand purpose for both of those, especially in targeting probably a younger market in both cases. Yeah, they're sort of they're in some ways mirror images, and yet exactly the same. So um, the issue with Gap was simply this. Uh, Gap had failed to follow its mission of supporting the incoming generation when it came to millennials. Did it for boomers, did it for Xers, Fail to really understand the millennial segment, no longer became relevant. No longer became part of culture. Brands must be part of culture in order to be successful. Um, the challenge there then was to was to find again the purpose and connection back to that millennial generation. Spotify is entirely focused on the millennial generation and is one of the great brands for the millennial generation. What we need to do now is understand how to transfer that to other generations. So you start at a core and then you have to move to another. What makes the brands very similar is a founder story and a mission that goes beyond the transaction. And for me, that's interesting marketing and it creates interesting narratives. <clears throat> so when I decided to come to Spotify, it was not an accident that uh, they were similar in the sense. And the challenges at Gap actually helped inform the strategy here in a very interesting way. Um. It's interesting, Seth, you know, as I said earlier, you're really involved in a lot of different parts of the marketing community and marketing industry. And I think um, we both know, a lot of people in this room know, it's, it's such a um, fascinating industry to be in right now. Um, you go to Cannes every year for the Cannes Lions International Festival of Creativity. Um, in fact, Spotify has a real presence there. Um, talk a little bit about how just the industry broadly has changed for, for folks who, you know, who perhaps don't have the purview that you have and how dynamic it has become um, and how the industry has, been, has become as complex as, as the business of marketing, if you will, the, the, the actual execution of marketing strategy. Well, there's been a massive shift from being advertising focused to content focused. I know that sounds like a glib thing that marketers say, but the truth is, Marketing is much more like journalism now than it ever was before. The idea is to find many, many messages that can essentially publish over time. So the skill set is different, the caps are different. Oh, thank you. Sorry, joke. <laughs> We're all just going to watch you drink your water. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, <coughs> so yeah, so like. Okay, well, you know what? You want to take a little break? Yeah, give me a minute. Thank take, you. Take a minute. Take a minute. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask of everybody here in the audience, what are your thoughts? You know, let's hear some feedback, not just questions necessarily, but thoughts, feedback, concerns, curiosity. <laughs> This is uh, Peter Mulder. I listen to, I use Pandora as opposed to Spotify. I really don't know what the decision making I went into selecting Pandora over Spotify. So from a marketing point of view, 
How would you convince me to say pick uh, Spotify as opposed to picky, uh, Pandora? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. The question is, how do you pick, you know, how do you pick Spotify over Pandora? And I guess the same could question could be said of any sort of almost like emerging platform, right? Something that's new, disrupting uh, a business, and there are a lot of competitors in a in a particular space, depending on what it is. Yours happens to be music, so how do you differentiate? Sure. So you know, Pandora for me is uh, it's radio that's been put on the internet. And it's, uh, it's a very sort of lean back experience. Uh, and so it's, um, it's a bit passive, but it's very simple. And I think that that's the value of, of Pandora. If you want to press a button and you want to listen and be programmed to, uh, Pandora serves your needs. What Spotify allows you to do is to control the music, to create playlists, to have on-demand access to virtually any song ever recorded in the world. So the choice is, do you want access to everything and tools to make it personalized, or do you want, or you want simply to enjoy what someone is programming to you? And those are, there's no judgment behind one or the other. They're fundamentally different. So generally what we see is for those who have, um, almost like a slightly higher value for music in their life, they choose Spotify over and over again. The role of discovery is fascinating. What we've done here, and it's mostly through software, software is eating the world, is we've been able to identify the listening taste of over 100 million music bands. And we see commonalities and differences. Having that scale of both the uh, catalog, the music, and the music fan allows us to say, you know what? 40% of what Bob is listening to is the same as what you know uh, Alexa is listening to. I wonder if we should introduce some of the other 60% that Bob is looking listening to to Alexa. And suddenly what you do is you open up an entire world of music to customers. That does a couple things. It, it, it really taps into that human need to discover, to feel like they're in the know, to grow, to be able to share their experiences. And it also creates for uh, access for artists to larger and larger audiences. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're an artist, and you're allowing radio or a Pandora to really deliver your music in a much more broadcast passive way, uh, then you have a much more limited opportunity to reach very targeted audiences. With Spotify, we know what people are gonna like even before they like it. It creates a real opportunity to expand the whole world of music for people. So the short of it, which is too late, I understand, Pandora is lean back, it's passive, uh, and it is, for many people, good enough. Spotify is much deeper, uh, it's much more functional, and it really allows you to discover music you never would have, and it kind of enriches your lives, your life, and expands your, your taste profile, your mind, your heart, your soul. Do you have both the subscription, and I should know, but I don't, do you, is there both a subscription model and an ad-supported model? You have both? We do. Yeah. We, um, yeah, that was one of the founding principles of Spotify was that uh, <clears throat> you know, all music was being stolen. It was on the internet. People were downloading it for free. Uh, no money was going back to the artist at all. But to get people to suddenly pay $10 a month, overnight for something that is free. You know, I think I'm a pretty good marketer, but I can't sell that, right? Uh, only the bottled water industry has figured that out. <laughs> and so the plan all along was to create an ad-supported, free-to-the-consumer tier that gave them an alternative to piracy. And when they rediscovered their value for music, the way that we deliver it, with all of that discovery, and over time they would realize that 
ten dollars a month was uh, very, very reasonable for the amount of value you got back. So it's the combination of the two tiers that has actually moved the streaming business forward. The other part of it is part is in our belief system. We fundamentally believe that all the world's music should be available to all the world's people. We don't believe in exclusives. We think when an artist releases an album or releases a track, everyone should be able to consume that. So by limiting only to a subscription tier, you're really limiting the ability of that music to be heard. So we think that it works as a, a really powerful ecosystem for both the artist and for the music fan. Any other questions for Seth? Yep. Um, we've been hearing a lot about uh, sports sponsorships, celebrity endorsements, and partnerships throughout the course of the forum. Um, and I've noticed that this is something Spotify has been doing more as well, where I get targeted emails, um, you know, related to bands that I listen to saying, here, we have this new t-shirt available to you that's only for Spotify users. Um, how big a part of that, how big is that going to be when it comes to your growth strategy? And then secondly, how difficult is that? You know, you say that you want all music to be available to everyone in the world. Well, obviously, that's, that's a real uh, disruptive approach and one that many musicians would obviously be against. Did you get that, Seth? Yes, not as much the second part, but the first part around uh, the targeted emails. Yeah, and just again, the difficulty of getting musicians to partner with you in those instances. Oh, yeah. Um, hopefully, we're <laughs> hopefully we're we're sending you emails about bands you actually really like. So we'll start there. Uh, it's uh, it's all about the data and um, really understanding you know your what we call super fandom. So what we've done quite consistently is we've identified um, you, you know fans of certain groups. We've segmented them and we've begun to create deeper engagement. And that benefits the, uh, the, the music fan because uh, they may get content or offers or opportunities to buy tickets ahead of you know, the average person. So that creates more value for the music fan. But it also creates more opportunity for the artist. One of the truths of the music business is that artists make most of their money not on release of albums, but on things like tours and merchandising, etc. So we have been actively building um, really products uh, that allow artists to reach their fans in this way. Uh, you know, if we can help with our data, a musician plan a tour where they can understand where their super fans are located geographically, they'll sell out tickets better, they'll have fuller shows, they'll make more money, same with merchandising. So we will do more of that because, again, it benefits the artist, their entire ecosystem, and it also feels like a, a benefit for the fans. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten one of those emails sent to me. I feel you know, like, how did you know that I love Lumford and Son? Like, this is so amazing. And I think that that's like a personal connection. When we talk about personalization, that's incredibly valuable. The second part of your question was, how do we get artists to work for with us? Um, you know, the, the truth is, artists uh, artists see Spotify now as the way that they can progress and launch their careers. I mean, we we have literally launched careers from an artist that was you know, small and dedicated, had a dedicated uh, fan base, to making them the one uh, artist. Uh, on Spotify, Diplo is an example of that. Lean on uh, as, a, as an example of a single. So we're creating more and more tools that let them connect. And there is nowhere else that you can have access to over 100 million music fans um, in, a, in a way that is really a meritocracy. If your music is good, it will find an audience. So artists are starting to understand that this is a very, very powerful place to launch, maintain, and grow their careers. Uh, I don't think we've done a great job of telling that story, to be honest with you. Um, but we, we recognize that. We recognize that the 
artist streaming relationship has been told by others who have different objectives and points of view. Uh, we're a Swedish company, so sometimes we're, uh, we don't like talking about ourselves too much, but you cannot allow the conversation um, you know, to be taken to you. You've got to control it and let you know, the, the truth really be known, and people will fundamentally change their perception over time. I think we have time for one or two more questions. There's one way up there. Hi, Seth, Jim Bolt. Um, question for you on uh, the Spotify product of brand playlists. Can you speak to how that further personifies the brand and relates to consumer engagement in that regard? Sure, absolutely. What we've, uh, what we've come to see is that um, Spotify created playlists have extremely high engagement and um, they've actually become almost like shows or sub brands in and of themselves. So, for instance, uh, Rap Caviar is curated by a guy named Tuma. I was at MTV years ago and he is probably the most insightful uh, editor in the world of, of hip hop. Um, so with him comes influence uh, and it comes knowledge. And as people are discovering music, uh, you often do need a guy. When you have, this is one of the problems of the internet, you have all of this information and it can become overwhelming. So you have to rely on trusted advisors and expertise. And we've found that these curated playlists do that quite well. Um, it's something that has been so successful that now we're looking at how we really turn them into more uh, kind of full-fledged programs, in a sense, and looking at we launch video on the, the platform. So how do we use video to also help people uh, you know, become educated about uh, new hip-hop artists, uh, to see behind-the-scenes footage from a show, what have you. And, um, you know, it's a really important part of our, of our growth strategy. It's, it's sort of interesting, you know, when, again, you go back to, like, be helpful to people. There are times when people want to create their own playlists. It is an act of creation. Just like the old mixtape, when you can access all of these tracks and put your own spin on it, you feel like you are empowered to create and share with the community. That's valuable. But then other times they want to rely on other members of the community or Spotify to help lead them down a path of discovery and that's the primary role of those playlists. More questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Courtney. You made the transition from a fairly large retailer and uh, brand with The Gap to a venture-backed startup. What was that transition like for you in the CMO seat, and what can we all learn from making a transition like that? Yeah, um, I think I'm making the transition. I don't know that I've made the transition. Um, it's uh, it's been fascinating. It's been fascinating. Um, sort of two points. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I relied on fully built out stable systems, support systems, uh, as much as I did at Gap until I came to Spotify. This is a very young company. We're still building things. Um, we have grown so quickly that um, the company that I, I started you know, with a year and a quarter ago is very different from the one I'm in now. And I've come to appreciate how important a uh, fully built out HR and recruiting team is. I've become to, I've come to appreciate how important, uh, you know, a really good uh, finance team is. And we're all building at the same time. And so what you realize is that, you know, you have to kind of adjust with one another so that you're not kind of overstepping or getting beyond the capabilities. Um, on the flip side of it, you know, there is there's no legacy to worry about. And uh, 
anywhere you go, and Gap was certainly uh, this situation. You're dealing with legacy systems, you're dealing with legacy procedures, and you're dealing with legacy thought and ideas. And to bring along change inside that environment is incredibly, incredibly difficult, both uh, emotionally, getting that share of mind and heart the company, people, and um, being able to uh, really get things done through the system. You know, one of my early learnings at Gap was if I wanted to change the light bulb in a store, it was going to cost four and a half million dollars, right? It's like massive. That's the downside of scale. There are no legacy systems here, so we are not challenged by those constraints. And it does allow you to then think about the future you want to create two, three, five years from now, and uh, and then just go at it. And that, to me, has been incredibly exciting and a little bit scary, to be honest with you. That's a great question. Uh I've got a question. I think it's great that you're bringing music to everybody, which is wonderful. Um, I'm a big concert guy. I've probably seen about 400 concerts, and it's getting harder and harder for the average person to get tickets through Ticketmaster or through even having to go to some place like a StubHub. As you're looking to grow the business, do you see yourself being able to provide tickets to the masses, to the fans that really like these bands, as opposed to having to go to the evil monster Ticketmaster or having to pay huge fees at the secondary market, someone like a StubHub. Yeah, um, absolutely. And you know, poor Ticketmaster, I think that that's like the most hated brand or something because, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a little bit unfair, right? They're, they're, they're like the tax collector. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it has become oppressive to people, and it does feel, feel terribly unfair. Uh, and you know, I think you're right that what has happened is um, the real hardcore fans sometimes cannot even afford uh, a ticket to the band. And these are the ones that if you, uh, if you created a more sustainable model, they wouldn't go to one show, they'd go to 30 shows. You know, uh, We can learn a lot from the group that or around marketing. Um, so what we think that we could do is we can take all of our data and we can take our infrastructure and we can take our platform and we can provide opportunities for super fans uh, ahead of the general public. Because you know this, and this was embedded in your question, a lot of those tickets are purchased, but they're not purchased by fans. They're purchased with the intent to resell. And uh, people make money, but the artist doesn't make that money. Right? Um, so the more that you can take that out of the equation, uh, I think that the better experience you're going to have. And, and honestly, I think it's, again, just good for, for music in general. Great. Okay. Well, Seth, um, we're going to leave it at that. We thank you so much for being here. We all got used to having you um, be larger than life in this room. So thank you, and um, please join me in thanking Seth Barber.